Playing his harp in the field, playing his harp in the palace, and uh, man, that's good, that's good. Take your Bibles, if you would, and turn to the book of John in chapter number 12. John in chapter number 12, and uh, I know that uh, several guys have said something about uh, the men's advance, and uh, I'll tell you that is why my voice is the way that it is right now. And uh, in fact, if, uh, if one of you Berluti boys could get me a uh, bottle of water, that would be a blessing, or Spencer, if you're up, I don't care. Um, and so it was just a good time, and uh, I, I describe it to people this way. We come together and we have a great time Amen. so that the preaching can punch you right in the face. <laughs> and uh, that's kind of how it is. And the, the problem that you folks have is after, uh, after I sit and listen to one, two, three, four, five, six, seven messages, man, I got a lot of stuff to say, you know. So <clears throat> relax. No, I'm... Uh, really, I'm, I'm going to make reference and use uh, some of the, the message from the men's advance as an illustration, and it's amazing how it kind of works out that way, but if you found your place in John chapter number 12, stand together with me, please, for the reading of God's Word to honor the Word of God this morning, John chapter number 12, and we're going to begin reading in verse number 1. The Bible says, then Jesus, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, which had been dead, whom he raised from the dead. And there they made him a supper, and Mary, Martha served, but Lazarus was one of them that sat at the table with him. Then took Mary a pound of ointment of spikenard, very costly, and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the odor of the ointment. Then saith one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, which should betray him, Why was not this ointment sold for 300 pence, 300 pence and given to the poor? Then he said, not that he cared, uh, th this he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the bag, and bare that which was put therein. Then said Jesus, let her alone. Against the day of my burial has she kept this. For the poor always ye have with you, but me ye have not always. Lord, I pray that you'd help us. Lord, as we look at this portion of Scripture, Lord, that you would just give us wisdom, Lord, and illuminate to our hearts and our minds the truth of it, Lord. But uh, more, than, uh, more than wanting to know the truth, Lord, we want to be changed by it. Lord, we are people that are in need of you. We are feeble. We are weak. Lord, we, we, have, no, uh, we have no superiority. We have, no, um, uh, we have nothing in and of ourselves that would be of any value to any person. Lord, the, but we have you, the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray that you would help us, that we might humble ourselves before you and give you the place that you deserve. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Just to kind of give you the context of where we are in this, in this passage, of course, we have uh, been going through the book of John, and, and Lazarus has been raised from the grave, and, and uh, he is living in Bethany, which is just a few miles outside of Jerusalem, and, and officially the, 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 the Sanhedrin, the, the Pharisees, and, and the high priest have made it a, an official thing that from now on, they will figure out a way uh, to kill Jesus. And we talked about that last week, and, and uh, they'll figure out a way. And so for a while, Jesus had stayed away from Jerusalem, and now he's about to make his way, and, and uh, the final week is going to begin here uh, not, not too long away. And, and so he's going to make his way towards Jerusalem. Can you imagine Jesus coming towards, uh, coming towards Jerusalem, leaving out of Ephraim, the city of Ephraim there, and heading towards Jerusalem and going, uh, and I, I understand perhaps this did not cross his mind the way I will present it to you, but him thinking, uh, where am I going to stay? The Bible said he had no place to lay his head, and where am I going to stay? Well, one of the things that every once in a while happens in, in, in our home, I'll call my wife and say, oh, by the way, we have company in an hour. <laughs> you know, and that's not her favorite thing. You know, so I try to give her a little bit more time, you know, at least a couple hours now. And, and uh, so, because she has some things that she wants to, to be in, <laughs> in place, you know. And, and so, but can you imagine Jesus coming into town and going, I wonder who I should stay with. 
I wonder what house I should reside at. Now, come, really, as we look at it, it was his pattern to stay with Mary and Martha and Lazarus. But what an incredible thing that that's the house that Jesus chooses to stay at. That's the place where Jesus chooses to reside. That's the place where Jesus felt comfortable. That's where the, the place where Jesus felt at home. And this was the home. And, and, I, and as I get there, I, 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 in my mind, I want to get down to, to Mary. Don't you want to get down to Mary with the, the box of ointment? Man, I can't wait to get down to Mary. We probably won't make it to Mary till next week. Uh, you're hoping we don't make it to Mary till next week. Because, uh, man, there's some incredible things. What Mary does is an absolutely incredible thing. But I, I'm stuck on this idea. I'm stuck on this idea that Jesus wants to be there. Jesus comes to town and he resides with them. He, he sups with them. He fellowships with them. And I'm thinking about all the things that, that the Lord had, would desire to do in a home and desire to do in a life. And he has to be invited in. I think about a, a church there in the book of Revelation where he stands at the door and he knocks. And he said, if any man will open unto me, I will come in unto him and I will sup with him and he with me. Man, the fact that Jesus wants to be with us is an incredible thing. He wants to reside with us. And I was thinking on this and it just so happens that my message yesterday was about Jesus living in the camp. So let's go back to Joshua chapter number 4. Joshua chapter number 4. The children of Israel have just made their way, have just made their way across the Jordan River. If you're familiar with the story, of course, they have been freed from Egypt. They have been freed from Egypt. They've made their way through the wilderness. And after 40 years, they have finally crossed the Jordan River. And so here they are, and they've crossed the Jordan River, and Joshua is going to give some instructions to them. The Bible says, then Joshua called, uh, chapter 4 and verse number 4, then Joshua called the twelve men whom he had prepared of the children of Israel out of every tribe, and Joshua said unto them, pass over for, before the ark of your God into the midst of the Jordan, and take you up every man of you a stone upon his shoulder, according unto the number of the tribes of the children of Israel. And this may be a sign unto you that when your children ask their fathers in times to come, what mean ye by these stones, then ye shall answer them. But the waters of the Jordan were cut off from before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord when it passed over Jordan. The waters of the Jordan were cut off, and these stones shall be a memorial unto the children of Israel forever. Let's pray. Lord, I pray that you'd help us. Lord, I need you. As we look at these things, Lord, I need you right now that you would give me the words to say in Jesus' name. Amen. You ever, you heard this story about the 12 stones being stacked up? One for each of the 12 tribes of Israel? Hey, this is the, this is the way I remember it. This is the way I was kind of taught it. I think this is the way it's in my brain, at least. The children of Israel come across the Jordan River, right? And they, they, they come across the Jordan River and Joshua says, I want you to take 12 stones one for each of the 12 tribes of Israel. And he, I want you to take them, and I want, you to, I want you to make a pile with them. I want you to stack them up. These are a memorial that, remi <laughs> excuse me, that remind us of the work of God, <coughs> the presence of God, remind us of the very person of God and the work that he's done in our life. So in my mind, you can see those 12 guys pick up the stones, and they carry those stones, and they come over here, and, and they make a pile. And specifically, the Bible says, when your son's sons, when your children ask their fathers in times to come, what mean you by these stones? And that's a, that's a kind of a feel-good thing. What mean you by these stones? And this is the way I picture it. A dad and a son walking along the coast of the, or the, the bank of the Jordan there one day. And they're wandering through a kind of a place, and there's some trees, and, and I've been on the Jordan there. The trees almost come right up to the bank, and and uh, they come through the trees and there's a clearing, you know, and the birds are chirping and it's a beautiful day. And they come up and all of a sudden they run into these pile of stones. And the son says, hey, dad, what meaneth thou by these stones? <laughs> and dad says, I'm so glad you asked, my son. These stones remind us of the salvation of the Lord the goodness of God, the presence of God, 
all that God has ever done for us. Man, isn't that awesome? And the son says, my father, that is an incredible thing. Thank you for sharing such wonderment with me. That's how you talk with your kids, right? Thank you so much. Shall we continue on our traversing? And they walk back home along the Jordan. That's how I picture it. And every once in a while, people run into the stones. What do you do when you run into a pile of stones? You say, what meaneth thou by these stones? Right? It's my wife does that when she runs into clothes and toys and she runs into, you know, uh, all sorts. What meaneth thou by these things? Put them away. You know, when you run into stuff, you're going to say that. And that's the way I pictured it. You know, it's a, it, was a, it was an event. Maybe there was even some, a spiritually minded dad that it was not happenstance. It was not, oops, I ran into the stones. He said, okay, kids, we're going on a trip. And all the kids said, no. And so he said, get all the stuff, pack it in the station wagon. We're going to drive up the bank of the Jordan over here. And we're going to drive over because there's a place that I want you to see. Has your dad ever taken you sightseeing? Uh, I'm one of those dads, so don't say anything that, bad about that. I, when I go to the museum, I want to read every word on every plaque. Yeah, nobody else likes to do that. <laughs> <clears throat> and so here I, you know, you're, you're driving all the way, and the kids are you're going, are we there yet? Are we there yet? And you're driving, you're driving, you're driving. Finally, you get there, you pay 46 bucks to park, you know, and, and you get the kids, and everybody comes around, and, and you come through, and you walk through the trees, and you go, there they are, kids. And they're like, and? You know, is there a ride? <laughs> no, no, I brought you to see a pile of stones. Ooh, the kids are all excited. And you say, no, 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 you don't understand what these, what these mean. These are the, this is the presence of, this represents for us as a, as a family, as a nation, the presence of God, the goodness of God, the salvation of the Lord delivered us from Egypt, delivered us from the wilderness, and brought us across Jordan. This is everything. This is all that we're about. The kid goes, that's cool. That's neat, Dad. That's awesome. Okay, back in the car. They get in the car and they drive home. Can I tell you, that's not the way it was supposed to be. That's the way I pictured it. Look what it says when we get down to chapter number four and verse number 19. The Bible says this, and the people came up out of the Jordan. So Joshua gave them the instructions in the beginning of the chapter, and this is the delineation of them actually carrying it out. And the people came up out of, of Jordan on the 10th day of the first month and encamped in Gilgal on the east border of Jordan. So they camped at Gilgal. And those 12 stones which they took up out of Jordan, Joshua pitched in Gilgal. He pitched them in the camp. You say, well, what's the significance of Gilgal? Take your Bible and turn over one page to Joshua chapter 5 and verse number 9. As God is establishing some things for the children of Israel after they've come across the Jordan. He's establishing some things. He's going to name the camp. He's going to name the camp. Verse number 9, the Bible says, And the Lord said unto Joshua, This day have I rolled away the reproach of Egypt from off you. Wherefore, the name of the place is called Gilgal unto this day. The, the word Gilgal, the name Gilgal, means to roll away. To roll away, the, the idea of, of, of bringing a stone or something to the edge of the hill and pushing it and watching it roll away. I was telling the guys yesterday when I was a kid, we used to get these big spare tires. We used to convince other kids to get inside of them. And then we'd roll them and we'd be like, we're just having fun. Just close your eyes, it'll be okay. And then we take them to the edge of the hill and we roll them away. You know, we watch them. And they're gone. Hey, that's the meaning of Gilgal, to roll away. And God says this, I want you to name it Gilgal because I want to remind you I have rolled away the reproach of Egypt. There is no more stain of Egypt. 
As Brother Matt said, all the soldiers of Egypt died there. Uh, you don't bear the sin that you had in Egypt. And this is a picture of salvation. Friend, when you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ and He forgave you of your sins, He forgave you of all your sins. Your sins as far as from the east as the west. Uh, they're, they're buried and they're no longer remembered. They're rolled away. Amen. My sin is gone. And I want to be reminded of that. I, I want to live with the knowledge that I no longer bear the punishment or penalty of my sin. Why would I want to go back to it? He said, I want you to name the camp Gilgal, and I want you to take the stones, and I want you to put them in the middle of the camp. The stones, the, the rock in the scripture is always a picture of Jesus Christ. He is the rock. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 tells us he was the rock that the water came from. He was the rock in the, in the wilderness. He is always pictured by the rock. And these stones re represent the very picture of Jesus Christ. But I'm going to tell you, this is the way a lot of Christians live. This is the way a lot of Christians live. They have their camp over here. They have their Gilgal. They're thankful that their sins are gone. They're thankful that they know the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior. They're thankful uh, that they, they have a name. They're thankful for what God has done. Uh, but, but, but Jesus doesn't live in the camp. They've not set up him as a memorial in their camp. And every once in a while, uh, they happen to be walking with their son, and some conversation will come up, and their son might happen to ask, well, what mean you by all this stuff? Oh, oh, well, let me, let me tell you. Or maybe a spiritually minded dad says, no, 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 we're going to go visit, and we're going to go over here, and we're going we're to spend a little time, and I'm going to tell you what, how good Jesus is. Friend, that is not the picture that God wants to give that Jesus is somebody that you visit. Jesus is somebody that you teach. Friend, he's supposed to be living inside the camp. Amen. He's supposed to be dwelling inside the home. He's supposed to be there. Now watch the picture. Watch what happens between the Old Testament and the New Testament. Because the, old, the Bible tells us very clear there in Hebrews that the Old Testament is a picture of those things which are to come in the New Testament. It, it, it is a shadow. It, it, the clarity comes in the New Testament. What was here in the Gilgal where they pitched the stones and those stones were specifically supposed to be uh, there to remind them and to uh, motivate them to live according to the Word of God and the will of God. They were supposed to have that camp. And in the, in the, in the book of Joshua, when the Joshua goes out and he starts conquering the land, they camped in Gilgal the entire time. When they defeated Joshua, guess where they camped? Gilgal. When they defeated Ai, guess where they camped? Gilgal. 33 kings they defeated in the land of Canaan. Canaan. They were camped at Gilgal the entire time. Because that's where God's presence was. You say, preacher, it's just a bunch of stones. Why would that mean God's presence is there? Take your Bibles and turn to the book of Judges and chapter number two. Judges, the very next, the very next verse, or very next book. Judges and chapter number two. Now we know there's a sad verse in this, in this, there's a sad verse. Here, look at verse number 10. Judges in chapter number two and verse number 10. The Bible says, and also all that generation were gathered unto their fathers. And there arose another generation after them, which knew not the Lord, nor yet the works which he had done for Israel. Now, isn't that what the stones are for? To remind the next generation of all that God had done? Hey, isn't that one of the reasons we come to church? So we can remind ourselves and remind the world what Jesus has done for us? Isn't that what, the, that's what the whole reason the stones were for? This generation, Joshua's generation, the Bible says in chapter number two that Joshua's generation served the Lord all the days of their life. So how is it that a generation that served God produced another generation that did not even know him? Man, that baffled me. Baffled me. Generation, we, we did a little history survey for the men's advance, you know, and I went, we went over to uh, Wesley Chapel, the outlet malls. We did it for two reasons. Lots of people there and further away from our church, you know, because we were going to have some fun with some people, you know. 
So I asked them some basic history questions. And man, you, you, you'd have to see the video. I mean, they don't know nothing. You know? Uh, one lady, I, I asked her, who did the Redcoats fight for? She's like, I got no idea. I said, Scandinavia, of course. Yeah. Uh, I corrected it later. Yeah. And uh, we asked them, we asked them I, I asked them, you know, questions. When did we claim our independence? What year did we claim our independence? Uh, one lady, she said, um, 1776. I said, you got it. She said, no way. <laughs> I said, yes. She said, I just picked that out of the air. <laughs> then she said, I'm going to play the lottery. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they didn't know nothing. Part of my English. Yeah. And I thought, how in the... But I bet you their parents did. I bet you their parents did. So how can, and, and we can talk, we can joke about that, but I will tell you, I've done the kind of, a lot of the similar surveys with church people about what's in the scriptures. How can a generation that knew the Lord and served the Lord produce a generation that didn't even know him and didn't even know the works when the whole purpose for the rocks, the whole purpose for the stones, so that you could tell your kids all the things that God has done? Judges, chapter number two, look what it says in verse number one. And the angel of the Lord came up from Gilgal to Bochum. Where was the angel of the Lord camped? Where are the children of Israel now camped? Bochum. Bochum, the name for Bochum, uh, the, the meaning for the word Bochum is place of weeping. Place of weeping. Here's how the next generation did not know the Lord or his works. Because the Joshua's generation, as they, were, as they were conquering and serving and doing, they were camping in Gilgal. Every day they'd see the stones and they would be reminded of God's goodness and of God's presence and his memorial to him, his salvation. And then after, the, after kind of the conquering was done, they're like, oh man, that was, whew, that was relaxing, now we're done. And so what do we do now? Man, we need to go to a nicer place. And they left Gilgal, and they went and camped in Bochum. Did God tell them to go to Bochum? No. Guess where their kids grew up? Their kids grew up in Bochum. Guess where the presence of God was? Gilgal. No wonder. Friend, it's not really the next generation's fault. When there's a home that Jesus Christ is not the center and not the memorial of it. Jesus deserves to have a place in our home. Why would we not want Jesus to be a guest at our home? Why would we want to not camp with the stones? Can I give you a couple quick reasons? One of the reasons we would not want Jesus to have a dwelling place in our home is because we know that he might not approve of some of the things that go on there. Might not approve of that. So instead of staying in Gilgal where the stones are, we move to Bochum. Why would we not want Jesus to live there? Or why would we not want uh, Jesus to dwell there? Hey, he might not approve of some of those things. Uh, maybe, perhaps the, the problem is not simply that he does not approve. Uh, maybe we feel like our work is done. That's what they felt. Work is done. Now that the work is over, we don't need to worry about camping around the stones. We can chill out in Bochum. While they did that, they sacrificed their children. Here's the way it's supposed to work. Those kids were supposed to wake up every morning and the first thing they saw when they walked out of that door was those pile of stones in the middle of the camp. I have a lots of kids. They ask why all the time. I used to be like, don't ask me why, I'm your father. Then I read the scriptures and the Lord's like, when your children ask why, answer them. Oh, okay. But you know what they ask why to? They ask why to things that are done on such a repetitious basis that it creates curiosity. 
They ask why to things that are seen and known and observed or clearly lacking and not observed and not seen. Something that is so a part of us that it creates curiosity. The generation of Joshua, though they served the Lord, they did not camp in Gilgal. And because they had their faith and they had their life, it was not a constant activity of their life. The work was over. It was finished. That it was not a routine of their life. So their kids stopped asking why there were no stones for them to see to ask about. They lived in Bochum. And here I think about in the New Testament. I'll just give you this picture. In the Old Testament, there's stones that represent Jesus Christ. Right? They picture Jesus Christ. He wants to be in the camp. Here in John chapter number 12, Jesus himself visits and stays this week with Mary and Martha and Lazarus. He resides there himself in person for this week. Man, what a privilege for Jesus to come over for a week. That would be awesome. Man, that would like, be incredible. Like, man, that would have, preacher, I think it would be awesome for Jesus to be in my house for a week. Can I tell you, after Jesus died and rose again, he said, he's going to tell, tell the disciples, it's needful for me to go away. You know why? Because Jesus can only stay in one person's house at a time. When he was walking on this earth, one person's house at a time. Guess where Jesus resides now? Amen. In my heart. Amen. Can I tell you about the privilege and the blessing of God? He pictures himself in the Old Testament as a lamb. He pictures himself as a rock. He pictures himself in these things that point to him. Then he's walking on the earth and he temporarily, uh, physically represents those things. And now Jesus Christ died, buried, and rose again. When I put my faith and trust in him, I believe on him. He forgives me of my sins. The Bible says, what know ye not that your bodies are the temple of the Holy Ghost? So can I just tell you this? You don't have to take your kids to visit stones. Amen. You are the pile of stones. That's good. You are the pile of stones. When your kids ask why, why is God so good? Why is God so faithful? Why? You know where they should get the curiosity? Watching you. Watching you. Amen. And they say, wow. My kids learn, should learn the manifold wisdoms, blessing, and love of God from seeing him in me. Amen. I'm the pile of stones. Jesus doesn't have to come for a visit. He lives here. Amen. So what do I do when Jesus is over? What do I do when Jesus lives with me? What did Mary and Martha and Lazarus do? It's another message that we'll do next week. <laughs> but I'm going to tell you, this is the way a lot of Christians live their Christianity. That Jesus is still a sightsee to go visit. Still an amusement park to stop in at every once in a while. Still a museum to read a couple plaques. No friend, Jesus is not somebody you visit. Jesus is somebody who dwells. Amen. Oh, I clean up when I go to church. Well, God bless you. He goes home with you. Yeah, that's right. Oh, if the church people knew some of the things that I did. Whew, they stop worrying so much about church people. Worry about your house guest. You say, but preacher, I do mess up. Me too. I'm first in line. And he is gracious and loving. And his blood cleanses us Amen. from all sin. So if I sin, I have an advocate. With the Father, and his name is Jesus Christ. Man, Christianity, mm -hmm, Bible Bible Christianity 
is not a religion. Religion is something you practice. Religion is something you conform to. Religion is something that is, um, is, is, uh, it, it is occasional. I'm going to go do something religious, a religious service or something. Bible Christianity is not religion. That's why religion is so damaging to people's understanding of who Jesus is. Bible Christianity is not religion. You know what Bible Christianity is? Is Jesus living in you. Well, why do we have church? Because we have a bunch of people that have Jesus living in them. We come together and we celebrate him for a little bit. <laughs> we come together and celebrate him. Let me kind of give it to you in this illustration. You know, if you, you guys, I like football and baseball and basketball and hockey and <laughs> anything that keeps score. <laughs> You know, if, if I watch badminton, if it was a tournament, you know, it, I would, I promise. And so you, I, I love that stuff. But can you imagine if somebody said, uh, we don't really need a game. Why? Hey, we practice. I mean, football's in us. We practice all week. We practice, hey, you know, we don't have to come together for a game. No friend, there needs to be a game. There needs to be a time to celebrate and cheer. Hey, all week you live with Jesus. We come to church together to celebrate how good he is. Amen. This is not the end. This is just simply the halftime show so you can go back out and play some more game. We celebrate Jesus because he lives here. Amen. Can I tell you what kind of responsibility that gives you? If you are the stones... If Jesus is living in you all the time, every once in a while, and texting is such a beautiful thing. I'll give you this illustration and I'll close. Texting, I love texting. <laughs> Kids today have it so good. It's not even fair. Okay, I'm telling you, if I had texting when I was a kid, I would have never gotten in trouble. <laughs> I'd have never gotten in trouble. Because my mom and dad used to say something like this. Hey, we're going to go to the store and then we're going to do some stuff. And when we get home, we want certain things to be done. We want them to be done. We want, you know, your room clean, the yard mode, whatever. I'd be texting my mom. So, how far out are you? How long till you return? You know? And of course, moms, they answer honestly. Oh, it's taking forever at Walmart. It'll at least be another two hours. Oh, that's too bad. <laughs> Which means I got another hour and 45 minutes before I have to start working. Right? It'd be awesome. If I was a kid today, man, I'd never get in trouble. But can you imagine instead of that, instead of that, through your cell phone teenager, your mother had something to where she could look through your phone, whether it was on or off, and she could always see you no matter where you were or what you were doing. Wouldn't that be a cool app for parents? It'd be awesome. Right? That kind of changed the level of responsibility, wouldn't it? You know? You're in the kitchen opening the snacks cabinet and you're like, dee -dee -dee. <laughs> stop it. <sighs> oh. You turn your phone upside down, open the cookie jar, dee -dee -dee. I still hear you. <laughs> Man, couldn't get away with anything. Hey, it is a privilege that Jesus resides in me. It is a joy. He is my God and my Savior, my brother and my friend. But it also is a responsibility Amen. that I might live in such a way that is pleasing to him. Amen. But can I tell you, I want to please him. I want to please him. I want him to live here because of what he has done for me. You are the stones. Let's pray. Lord, I pray that you'd help us. Lord, that we might be obedient to you. Lord, that we might love you. Understand the responsibility in the way that you want us to live. You are not someone that is to be visited. You are not somebody that is to, on occasion, seek counsel or on occasion cry out to for help. You are somebody that is to be residing, dwelling, fellowshipping. 
with us. Lord, and maybe there are some here that if they were honest, they do not know you as their Savior. They do not know if their sins have been forg forgiven. They do not know if you are dwelling in them. They do not know if they've been born again as a child of God. And there you are, desi you are desirous to save them, forgive them, and to dwell with them. Lord, I pray that you would speak to their heart and say, that's what I need. That's what I need to be forgiven. To have something done with my sins. Jesus died on the cross for them. He rose again. He paid the penalty already. Lord, I pray that you'd help them to see that they can have forgiveness in a relationship with the God of the universe, Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray that you'd be with believers. We so easily can become professional Christians and build up fancy, fancy camps and forget that you are to be the center of them. You are to dwell in them. And you are to be the very one that determines the destination and the direction of our life. Lord, may we give you what you already deserve, the authority to do and to say in our life what is needed. Lord, might we humble ourselves before you, lest we find our children growing up in Bochum, lest we find ourselves moving our camp into Bochum. Lord, may we humble ourselves before you. With heads bowed and eyes closed.